like the story I was going to share is not, not quite as good, but uh, yeah, come see me afterwards and we'll talk bears. Uh, I've got a lot of good bear stories uh, in, in my life, so, but uh, Jake may have inflated the story a little bit, but, uh, but still, uh, pretty much true, so come and see me, we, we can talk about it, but, well, I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight, I'm honored to, uh, uh, to have the privilege to uh, look into God's Word with you, I'm excited about the series that you all are starting um, this evening, we're going to be opening uh, up to Jonah chapter 1. Uh, so go ahead, if you have your Bibles or your phones, uh, and take a look at Jonah chapter 1. And when you're there, uh, I'm going to invite you to stand uh, in honor of, of reading of the Word of God uh, together. So please stand with me as, we, uh, as, as, as I read through the, uh, the text here. So Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each tried to, uh, cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will... Give a thought to us that we will not, may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose accounts evils come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and, sac and, and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray. Well, Father, I thank you for this story. I thank you for this book of the Bible. I thank you uh, that you are the great and mighty missionary God. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to pray together for missions all across the world tonight. But Father, we gather here this evening wanting nothing less than to hear your words. Lord, we come with hungry hearts longing to see and know you. Lord, I pray that you would come and move mightily. That you would move and bless the proclaiming of your word. Father, I pray that you would convict us. That we would not be tempted to listen to the word neutrally. But that we would come wanting to be changed. So Father, we plead, we ask that you would move. And with great expectation, we look into your word. To behold the great works that you have done. And the heart that you have for the mission of you. 
And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You all can take a seat. Well, I don't have a great bear story, but I know a moment when I have failed. I had utterly failed, and my school track career was over. Any runners in here? I'm just curious. No runners in here. Perfect. <laughs> well, then this will just be a, a good little, uh, little tale for you. You can you know, learn a little bit about track here. Uh, when I was in like middle school going into high school, uh, I was on a track team, and my event that I ran was uh, hurdles. So it's those like bars that you jump over and, uh, when, when you're running. And so uh, I ran the 100 meter hurdle and the 300 meter hurdle. And uh, I, just, I was kind of awkward. Well, it was kind of awkward. It was still kind of awkward. Uh, but I was kind of awkward in middle school and high school age. And so I can just remember, uh, like, my run was kind of funny. And so uh, when I would jump over these hurdles, uh, one day my, my coach told me, so it, it, if you have never run a hurdle before, the way you do it is you don't actually like jump over a hurdle. You're supposed to more, it's more like a step. Like you're not, it's not really supposed to break stride with how you're running. And so uh, one day my coach came up to me and he said, Thomas, your, your jump is terrible. <laughs> he's like, we gotta fix this. And so he's like, you can't like lift your foot up and then do like this, you've got this weird like jump, you're literally jumping. And so he worked with me to, to kind of craft my technique for how I would basically step over this hurdle. And it was really, really uncomfortable at first. If any of you all have done any sports at all, um, you know, like, coach, when, he, when he's teaching you or showing you a new technique, it's really uncomfortable when you first try it. Uh, and so he worked with me for a couple of weeks before our first meet, and, uh, and so I was ready to go. Well, first meet. I'm on the starting blocks about to, to run the 100 meter hurdle and I'm on the starting blocks and I decide, you know what, I'm going to do this my way. Coach does not know my confidence level, he doesn't know my, like, me, what I feel good about, so I'm not doing it coach, so I'm just going to do it my way. And so I decide that on the starting blocks, the starting gun goes off and I take off running and y'all, I'm killing it. I'm doing great. Like out there with like the leaders and, and I'm killing it. So I'm, I'm booking it. I get to the end, th three hurdles away. I jump over the first one. I'm out in front, jump over the second one. I'm going to win this thing. Third one, last hurdle. I do my, my little jump thing that was awkward. Foot clips the hurdle and y'all, I face plant. Just like, yeah, and it's like middle school, so, oh, yeah, it was weird, it was awful, and I like, you know, I'm picking my face up on the ground, I look up, and I see my coach, and he knows, oh, he was watching, and he knows my technique, he knew exactly what I had done, it was a terrible moment, I had failed the team, and I had failed the coach, now, when someone fails you, what do you do, we might get angry, we might yell, we might blame them countless times, but one of the things that we tend to do is just to give up on them. We turn to more apathy than just anger. And um, that's what I knew at that point. I was like, coach is done with me. Like, my track career is basically over. But what happened next in this story changed me. At my next practice, I was expecting coach to utterly ignore me. Like I wouldn't give myself the time of day. To be cold to me and to shun me. But coach, he was with me the whole practice. For a very long time, multiple practice practices after that, I ran so many hurdles that I left practice jumping. But what I remember about that practice, what I remember about this story is that my coach didn't abandon me. Like he, he made me run. He worked me hard. I was spent, but I felt more confident as I headed into the next track meet. But really, the story says so much more about my coach than it does about me. Thank goodness my failure is not the hero of this story. On the contrary, I look back at the story in my life and, and I don't stumble on my failure. I remember the kindness and intentionality of my coach. And as we look into our text tonight, we don't see the heart of a coach who loved his terrible runner, but we see the heart of a God who loved those who ran far from him. 
We're jumping into a series called The Missionary God. And you will be uh, uh, in this series for the next three weeks, I think. Uh, next three, three weeks or so. And um, Jonah is a really interesting book. It's a short book about God's sovereign design and his heart to save. The book of Jonah is this unique, uh, short uh, account of a minor prophet named Jonah. Now, a, a lot of you may have heard of the story of Jonah before, may have studied the story of Jonah before, Christian or non Christian. I mean, it's just kind of a famous story. Uh, this guy gets swallowed by a whale and then he comes out, he comes up. There's a Veggie Tales movie about it. <laughs> Veggie Tales, shout out. Yeah. Um, but when we look into the story of Jonah, I'm going to be honest with you. We get stumped about what to do with this guy. This story is kind of a weird story. We're, we're stumped with what to do with him. If we look at Jonah as the hero of this story, it doesn't take long to realize he is a terrible hero. He whines and he rebels and he disobeys God. He grows to hate the very people God sends him out to love. What are we to do with a character like that who's supposed to be our hero? But, much like the memory of my track season, the story of Jonah is not ultimately about Jonah. One of the purposes of this prophet is to proclaim to a group of people who God is and the way that God is working and what God is doing in the world. And so as we jump into the book, we're setting out to answer that question. But I need you to see from the start that if Jonah is the hero of this story, and this is one of the most tragic and depressing, despairing books of the entire Bible. God is the main character. The main starting cause, the catalyst, the initiator of the action. This book is an anthem to the sovereignty and power of God. An anthem of the one who created all things. So I want to return to this question as we jump into the text. What are we supposed to do with Jonah? How is the love of this missionary God demonstrated in the story of Jonah? And so the first thing that we see is the God who initiates. The God who initiates, which just means begins. The God who starts. The one who moves first. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. From the start, we see the first person to make a move is God. God begins. He initiates the, his story. His word comes to Jonah. And he says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Now, context here. We need to marvel at this point. And if you, if you were the, the first time like that you heard this story, if you were uh, the, the, the original readers, you would have been stunned too. Now, Jonah is a Hebrew. He fears the one true God. And this servant, sorry, it is this servant, Jonah, that the missionary God sends to one of the darkest places on the planet. Nineveh is a great city, a huge city. If you were walking across Nineveh, it would take you three days to cross. It's a big city. It's like a fortress. It's unwelcoming. But the real word of Nineveh is that it houses the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, their whole culture was built around two things. War and aggression. That summed up the Assyrians. They were the terror of the world. Nahum, who's another prophet, he later, he calls this city a city of unceasing evil, a city of blood, full of lies and plunder, full of victims. So this is like God saying, I have seen the evil of these terrorists. Go and cry out against them because their evil has come up before me. This is not the ideal mission for a Hebrew prophet. This is a suicide mission. The Hebrews and the Assyrians were enemies. And in fact, the Assyrians were kind of enemies of everybody. They were the bullies of the ancient world. Yet God sends Jonah to these very people because of their evil. And God is the initiating God. He doesn't wait for Nineveh to clean up their act. 
No, he doesn't fear Nineveh. God is not intimidated by the Assyrians. He's not intimidated by Nineveh. On the contrary, he has compassion on this distant, evil city. And that's good news for us, by the way. Look, some of you here tonight see yourself as this kind of, like you have this kind of persona about you, perhaps. Some of you here tonight see yourself as unsavable. Some of you think about yourself, uh, you have this persona of confidence. You, you like that, that others are intimidated by you and just kind of how you act. Listen, God is not intimidated by you. He's not intimidated by you. He's not intimidated by your agenda. The greatest bravery is shown when someone extends compassion in the face of hatred. And that's what this book is about. That's what God is doing here. And at so many points in this book, there are these, huh, moments. But like all over this book, we think we know what's going to happen. And then at the last minute, oh, it's some, someone else does something that we don't expect. That, that's a pattern that you see across this book. What could be more unexpected than this? God sends one of his own people into the darkest place on the planet to tell them to repent. A nation that hates the Hebrews. And yet, when God says to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, notice this. Jonah arises and he flees to Tarshish, away from God's presence. Now, I want you to step back and see. God's character is contrasted with Jonah. Jonah is repulsed by the Ninevites, by the Assyrians. He would see them destroyed, wipe them off the face of the earth. As they have done to so many nations. To Jonah, God should be initiating wrath towards these Assyrians. They're terrible people. They're all about war and aggression. And yet God is initiating mercy. God calls Jonah to arise and go. But Jonah rises and flees. Down to Joppa. Down into the hull of a ship. Now, I think a lot of times we're quick to... Uh, to cross our arms. We know what we should do, right? We should cross our arms and say, Jonah, you can't not serve God. You can't get away from God, Jonah. Come on. That's not how it works. But how often we can find ourselves the complete opposite of our initiating God. How often are we quick to size people up and to predetermine, yeah, that person's going to hear the word of God. <laughs> that person, you got to get no, they're not going to hear the word. How quick are we to do that? To size people up, to make judgments on whether people will believe this message that we have to proclaim to the world. We take liberties that we have no right to take when we determine who's going to listen to God's word and who's not. Especially with people who we don't like or people who are different than us. Who have different views Different understandings of the world who worship different gods. But we like to dictate how and when we are going to allow God to use us. Yeah, yeah, I will serve the Lord as long as serving the Lord lines up with my expectations. Y'all, the Bible is one massive narrative of God's love defying our expectations of it. That's what's happening in the Bible. We're quick to categorize people it, by many number of criteria and then to grumble to ourselves, what? I don't you need to be kind to this person? You need to share the gospel with this person? Look, God delights to blow our limited human notions of love away and replace them with an initiating love that changes everything. That's all over the word of God. Now listen, I'm not saying that there are not times and seasons to our ministries, the various methods of ministries, but I am saying that it is rebellion when we have a clear mandate to proclaim the word of God to every tribe and every tongue and every nation where we are going into all the earth and we say, no, I'm comfortable with where I am. I'm not doing that. Yeah, listen, I'll decide. 
the ways in which I'll obey God. I'll decide which parts of my life I'm going to give God access to. And that's where some of you very well might be tonight. This may be your story right now. But I don't want you to miss this. This is so important. I don't want you to miss this. The whole point with this text is not that we have a prophet here with Jonah who is perfect and we need to be like him. Like We have a prophet here who's like us. We have a prophet, one who is self-centered and self-protecting, one who is so sick with his own ambitions that he has been disillusioned to God's grace. If you are a child of God, when you fail, when you turn inward and refuse to do hard things for the sake of the gospel because you're wanting to be the center of your life and protect your own comforts, when you disobey and run from God, when you try to find your own way driven by your own preferences over God's missionary way, then in that moment, does God quit on you? No. God doesn't abandon us. Huh? Do you see the huh moment here? Isn't that when God abandons us? When we're rebellious and running from Him? When we constantly trip over the hurdle and face plant? When we've chosen to do our own thing? No, it's then, in that moment, that He pursues us. The second thing that we see is the God who pursues now Jonah, he's making for Tarshish. It's a fun word to say. Say it five times fast. Tarshish. He Tarshish would have been the opposite end of the known world in comparison to Nineveh. Okay, so as far away as he could get from God's presence, as far away as he could run, that's what Jonah does. And he develops plans for fleeing from God's presence. He plans out his escape from God. So he finds a ship. And he pays the, the captain of the ship, and he makes plans. This is how I'll run away from God. And those plans come crashing down. He's, he's in the bottom of the ship, but in verse 4 it says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea. It's a contrasting word here. Once again, we see that God is working first. First, he acted through his word, and now he's speaking again through this storm. God did this. By the way, don't, when you read this, God is the one who made the storm. Now, make no mistake. God is the one who makes the storm, and the storm is mighty. And it's so powerful that it says that the ship is threatening to break up, like split in half. But do you see where Jonah is at this point? Where he's gone, where he's traveled? He has gone nowhere but down, down, down. He goes down to Joppa, down into the hull of the ship. Jonah is on a path away from God's presence, and he's descending deeper and deeper and deeper into the sleep of his own rebellion. So when the captain comes down and he finds Jonah, the captain, who is not a believer, he does not worship the one true God, he tells Jonah, the prophet of God, Hey, dude, you should be praying. Like, that's another huh moment. You should be praying. And even this, this man who served many different gods, a pagan, he knew that this storm had an author behind it. That God used even this pagan to bring about brokenness in Jonah. We can see the traces of ourselves in Jonah's wet, soggy, storm-drenched state. You all have been like Jonah. Maybe some of you are like that tonight. When you run from God and you think that you want to escape, you want to descend further and further away from Him to sleep in safety. It's like when, like when you're younger and... Uh, you know, like, the, you know, 6 o'clock, 6 a.m., and your mom comes in to wake you up from school, uh, for, for school. And what do we do? We go, ah, and we pull, the, we pull the, the cover up over us just only a few more minutes. We want to be left alone in our sleep. 
rebellion, which is sin, rebellion, running from God, it convinces us that the pathway to joy is to sleep apart from God. But praise God that when we are sleeping, He never is. When we think that all we want is to be separate from God, He relentlessly pursues us in His mercy. Think about the story. First, God sends this mighty tempest to stop the ship. Then he sends a pagan captain to tell Jonah to pray to God for mercy. And then, if that wasn't enough, he sends the whole crew to awaken Jonah by casting lots. And here too, it's here that Jonah is found out. So, by the way, casting lots, it's this ancient world uh, way of inquiring of the Lord who's guilty and uh, what God wants in a specific situation. So it's kind of, here it's depicted as more of a trusting and divine control, not so much as like gambling. Um, so th that's what's happening here. Now, you can imagine Jonah in this moment. They're all going to cast these lots, roll these dots, figure out who's guilty here. And you can, Jonah, now the ship's about to break in part. The tension is mounting here. And Jonah's goodness, they're going to cast lots. His eyes are getting big, and he's looking around, and he might even be begging, please don't let it fall on me. Please don't let it fall on me. And of course, the lot falls on Jonah. And so the sailors ask, well, what's your occupation? What do you, where do you come from? What do you do? What's your country? And Jonah responds with the truth. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear Yahweh, the one true God who made the sea and the dry land. Oh, by the way, I love this. Did you notice Jonah didn't say what land he was from? He said, well, I'm a Hebrew, and I serve the God who made the land and the sea. Like, which is comprehensive. Like, find somewhere in the earth that isn't land or sea. It, it's, it's, it's comprehensive. He made everything is his point. And the sailors now see, and they understand the power of Jonah's God. In verse 10, it says, uh, for the men knew that he was fleeing for the presence of the Lord. And they said, uh, verse 10, it says, they were exceedingly afraid. It's the hand of Jonah's God who has the power to make a storm like this. It's going to rip our ship in half to make the lots fall to Jonah. And he alone can stop the storm. Now, this is the central pillar of the book. This, this thing right here. The central pillar for the whole book is that God is the creator and God is sovereign, which means the pagan gods are not. They can't stop the storm. God alone has the power to stop the storm. Only the creator, the sovereign creator, can bring about Jonah's, Nineveh's, and the sailors' deliverance. Only Jonah's God, the God whom we serve, is the source of life. The only saving grace they have is God's mercy. And their sailors get this, so they say, what do we have to do to you to get the storm to stop? So Jonah says, well, throw me into the sea, and that'll, that'll fix everything. And this is the lowest moment so far for Jonah. He's been found out. He, he has been known and exposed. He realizes there's no question why this is happening. I am about to die because of my sin. I am about to lose everything because of my rebellion. Have you known this moment in your life? Like, when you know you're rebelling, you're running from God. And you keep saying things like, just please don't let me be found out. Please don't let me be found out. And yet, your sin comes to light some way or another. Or maybe you can't even take it anymore and you need it to come to light. Because it is miserable, you all, to try to keep your sin hidden. It's draining. Let me encourage you. Some of the greatest, most... Um, Salvific salvation moments come in the darkest and most despairing times. When your sin is finally exposed for unbelievers and believers alike, in the embarrassment and in the shame, when you have face planted in the lowest of lows, when we think to ourselves, I am, is this God's 
wrath? Is the storm God's wrath? This is God's hatred, right? It's his apathy towards Jonah. I don't care what happens to him, right? And while God isn't delighted in Jonah's rebellion, the answer is an emphatic no. It's actually, the storm is God's agent of saving Jonah. Do you see that it's God's mercy that Jonah is found out? It's God's mercy when he sends, when he sends storms into our life to relentlessly wreck our plans of self-protecting rebellion. And while, yes, it's terrifying, it's embarrassing, don't you see that this storm is exposed, the exposing of Jonah is the pursuing love and mercy of a missionary God. God is so gracious when he doesn't leave you asleep. Even when you lash out, God, just leave me alone. I'm going to do things my way. Let me stay here in my own kingdom even when you are strategic about how you, you're going to escape God's claim on your life, God pursues relentlessly. Even unto the depths of despair, even death itself will not stop the intentions of the almighty sovereign God. And that's good news for you tonight. If you find yourself stuck in patterns of rebellion and God is convicting you of those things, this is his mercy to you, to save you tonight. And by the way, as we, as we look forward, as we look out to the end of what, where all this is going, the sailors, by the way, they fear Yahweh now because of God's power in response to Jonah's guilt. The, the sailors, yeah, the ones who didn't believe in God, they saw the, the storm that God created. And they see the storm that he calmed. And this is a testimony of God's Grace. Jonah, at the end of this, has a testimony of God's grace, not of his own goodness. He doesn't have any. God has saved him. God's grace is what freed him from this. And if you are like Jonah tonight, if you ever have been, I, I want to tell you all, listen. God is your only hope of life and salvation. That's it. Like you're not good enough. You can't earn your way to God's favor. You can spend your whole lifetime and you wouldn't successfully earn God's favor. Our testimony is one of grace. And the last thing that I want us to see tonight as we wrap up here is that we see the God who saves. The God who saves. Because we can't stop here. It, it's not merely enough to know that you are sinful. You need saving it's not just enough for Jonah to be found out, though it's part of his saving, but God has other plans. So they hurl Jonah into the sea. The sea becomes quiet. And here we see that Jonah knows he's got to give up his life in order to save these men. He has to submit himself to the wrath of God and descend into the dark abyss of this sea. And at first, the sailors don't want to do it because they know this is a prophet of God and they we throw them in the sea. Is God going to do something to us? So they try to save themselves, but they can't. And so they and Jonah have come to the end of their plans. And at every level of this story, God is at work to stop, to thwart the plans of man for his plans. So when the sailors realize they can't save themselves, they pray to God. Once again, a uh, huh? moment. And the first prayer to God in this book comes from these sailors. And they cry. Out for God's mercy, that they would not be counted guilty of Jonah's death because they know Yahweh does according to his will. So they pick Jonah up, they throw him into the sea, and the sea ceases. And then just note that the sailors, they fear Yahweh. Not because of his power, not just because of his power, but because of his grace. He didn't crush them, although as a sovereign God, he had every right to. But he gave them mercy. Now, the end of Jonah chapter 1. I'll be honest with you, it's unsettling to me. The end of Jonah 1 is incredible. 
but unsettled. God appoints a fish, sovereign God, he can do what he wants, and it swallows Jonah to save him. The, the, the ship, the, the, the fish swallowing Jonah saves Jonah from drowning. And uh, once again, this is in an unexpected means. God initiates in a way we wouldn't always choose, sending Jonah to Nineveh, but he also saves in a way that we wouldn't always choose. So the end of chapter 1 is unsettling. Because we leave Jonah, when we leave Jonah, he is in the smelly, nasty innards of a fish's belly for three days and three nights. We've gone down to Joppa, down into the ship's hole, down into the sea, down into the belly of a fish. And that's the end of our text. That's where we end. The end of chapter 1 leaves us waiting, longing, hoping for some kind of ascent, some kind of escape. We're left reaching at the end of this chapter. Some kind of resurrection. When we come to Verse 17, all plans have been thwarted, all hope is lost, and we are now in the deepest and darkest place in the text. But remember, God has not worked to abandon Jonah. He has worked to save him. So, here's the question. Who is God trying to save? Who is God trying to save? Is he trying to save um, the Ninevites who worship their own sin? Is he trying to save Jonah, the selfish and salty Hebrew prophet who does whatever he wants? He's a failure of a prophet. The sailors who cry out to false gods initially and depend on their own strength. Which one of these is God saving? And the answer is yes. At every corner and at every angle, God is at work to save because for every character in this story, God alone holds the power of salvation and of saving grace. He alone can deliver storm-tossed sailors. He alone can turn a whole city from its evil, and he alone can save a rebellious and selfish heart. And there are none too far from our missionary God's love, including you tonight. Just as we see God's sovereign might and power at work for salvation at every turn in this story, we also see the looming shadow of one who is greater than Jonah. We are left at the end of chapter 1, not just looking forward to Jonah's deliverance, but to our own. Because the truth is, Jonah's not the hero of this story. We look to a man who doesn't run from proclaiming who God is, but by his very coming proclaims the fullness of who God is. We look forward to a man who is the very one that Jonah fears as creator of heavens and the earth. We look forward to a man who, like Jonah, jumps into the depths of death that by his sacrifice he will save many across the world. We look forward to a man who will descend into the belly of the earth and in three days rise again, having emptied death of its power. See, our hope is not in our own efforts. It's not in the perfect obedience of this prophet, but in the perfect obedience of another prophet. Jonah is not the hero. You are not the hero. Jesus Christ is the hero. In Matthew 12, Jesus says, one who's greater than Jonah is here. Jesus Christ is the true Jonah. The one who would walk in perfect obedience to God's command and yet dies a sacrifice, not for his own rebellion, but for our rebellion. Jesus Christ is the one who would calm the storms of God's righteous wrath towards sinners by bearing the full punishment of man's sin at the cross. Praise God that he is the one who would initiate a pursuit for unexpected people like us in unexpected places. 
and rescue us in even unexpected ways. Even death on a cross. But apart from Jesus, this one who is better than Jonah, there is no hope. And I hope that this text unsettles you. I pray that this text unsettles you if you don't know Jesus tonight. So, if you are without him, you're with Jonah, and you're drowning in death apart from him. So if I can plead with you tonight, if you are running from God, stop. He's pursuing you. You know how I know? Because the word is being proclaimed right now. This is his agent to save you right now. And if I can plead with you, maybe you profess his lordship, but he is calling you to serve in unexpected ways and in unexpected places, to reach out to an unexpected person at, in your class or at your work, at your job, wherever. Please listen to him. Maybe you're trying to proclaim Jesus is Lord, but you're monitoring which parts of your life that you're going to give him access to. And you are living an act of rebellion. And maybe you find that you've never trusted in Jesus as Lord. Don't put off trusting and crying out to him tonight. You might be the storm-tossed vessel in this room that he is breaking that he might save. He died and rose so that you can have life. He did what children never could and what you never can. So that you might have life. You need to stay your mind upon this God. Who has a missionary heart for you. To sink into the endless bounds of the oceans of his love. That you can go forth and share these oceans with other people. You never hear the word of God neutrally. Right now. You are responding in humble obedience or you're running. God is for you. And he's not against you. My prayer is that you would receive this initiating, pursuing, saving love. Pray with me. Father, we are we are in such need for you. This text is unsettling because it shows us the ends of ourselves. It shows us without a doubt that you are the sovereign and mighty God of all creation. And it forces us to come face to face with our own running from you. Lord, for the, for the one in this room tonight who is running from you, please, Lord, I pray that you would thwart their plans of fleeing from you. That you would move in their heart to run and embrace you and receive you as the great God of love that you are. Lord, I pray that, that blind eyes would see tonight, that deaf ears would hear, that the dead would live because they trust in you tonight. Lord, I pray for those who have people in their lives who know they need to go and tell them the gospel. I pray, Lord, that you would empower us to be missionaries in every class across this campus and that this campus would be radically changed through a gospel people who have been touched by your missionary heart. God, would you make our hearts like yours? God, would you move now and help us to respond? Thank you for your word, and we ask these things.